so I've got, I've got four kids and I'm telling you, it's, it's awesome sometimes. And so, uh, you know, you, if you've got kids or grandkids, you, you're going to understand what I'm about to say. And you may not fully agree with what I'm about to say, and that's okay. You're wrong, but that's okay. Because we, the other night, for example, at the head home, that's my last name, if that confused you, at the head home, we were hanging out and you start hearing arguing between three of our four. And it's, it's kind of, it's been spring break, okay? So you're with them a lot, okay? Moms, you know what I'm saying? They're like, yeah, thank you, somebody speak up for us. And they're arguing and they're doing their stuff. And so what happens is one comes upstairs and says, well, this person did this and this person did this. And I'm like, you know what? Go figure it out. Or, for example, whenever they, they, they come home from school and they're like, well, this person did this and this person did this. I mean, what I could do is I could say, are you serious? That second grade, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get on the bus the other next day and I'm going to tell that second grader. Or I could say, I want you to go figure it out. Or when they are having struggles with friends and they're having struggles in different ways, if, if I really wanted to, I could say, you know what, just, just come on in, let me hold you. It's gonna be okay. And you're, and, and you're right. I'm sure you did nothing wrong. You're a pastor's child, you're perfect. I, I, I could say that, I, I could do that. But that wouldn't help them. If I continue to coddle them and never say, hey, go figure it out on your own, I never truly help them. And we don't help them take responsibility. And we're really not teaching them life. And we're really not showing them that going to figure it out is always going to be something that we need to do. I mean, life truly, as y'all know, it, it can be difficult. It can be very hard. And it is hard, not can be. For some of y'all, like, no, it is right now. You have no idea what I went through to get here. Uh, it's, it's, I came to see, to hear from Pastor Jordan and the Lord, and then I got you. All right, so I'm gonna stick it in. I'm gonna give you the first five minutes. If you make me laugh, I'll stay. So <laughs> hopefully you're still here. Thank you. And maybe you've, you've, you've had a rough morning or, or, or maybe you've had just a rough week. or Maybe this year has been rough for you. And here, here's, here's what I know, is that it can be, life can be very difficult. There's two things. Life can be difficult because of us, which is where I hang out a lot. Okay, like I, I hang out in the man, I screwed up, my bad, oops, here we go again, Michael, shut your mouth, all that kind of stuff. Like I hang out in the man, I can make life difficult on my own, which we all can, or life can be difficult because we get the phone call that we could never have imagined that we would get. Or that person walked out on our life that we weren't expecting. Or maybe someone has hurt you and you would never have thought that they were the one that was going to hurt you. In either situation, here's what could happen. God could say, it's okay, come on in. It's okay, it's not your fault. It's okay, let me, let me hold you. And this isn't how life is supposed to be because I'm God and I'm good and you should never have troubles. No, what God says, instead of sheltering us, for us to respond, he says, I'm gonna give you a chance to go and figure it out with me, with me. And instead of sheltering us in these difficult situations, he is trying to develop something great in us. Understand what I just said. Instead of sheltering us in difficult situations, he is actually trying to develop in us something great as long as we respond appropriately. There's three typical responses to these issues that we go through in life, three typical responses, okay? The first one, I can do it myself. You go through a hard time, I'm gonna push through, I'm gonna press on, I'm a man, I know how to do this, I don't cry, I'm a man. Notice I said that a few times, men. It's not gonna get you very far coming from someone who has pushed really, really hard before. So sometimes we respond in hard times, you know what? I'll do it on my own, I don't need anybody. Second way that we can respond is we look for a solution all around us. And so we put it on Facebook to see what everybody else thinks about our issue or issue with that other person. And we take all those issues, we're like, there's, uh, 
so many beautiful counselors on Facebook that can help me. And then we, we take that as the word and then you screenshot it and you send it out and we could respond in that way as well. Or you say in the hard time that you're in, you could say, well, this is just my life. I mean, I've screwed up a lot and I deserve this because I've done this or I've done this. And so I'm in this awful place in my life because I deserve it. I'm a bad person or I had this family growing up. And so there'd be no reason for me to actually walk in freedom. There'd be no reason for me to be joyful. And so you just feel like maybe that's where you should be. Or here's the best response. Here's the best response when we're going through anything hard. And we're going to read about that in the book of First Samuel. The best response is faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you hear that in a church like, oh, that is good, pastor. That's really good, faith. But, but do we even know what faith is? We say it, we preach it, we sing about it, we raise our hands to it, we say all these things, but do we know what faith is? And I hope, my prayer is that by the end of this message, we actually understand what it means to walk in faithfulness. And Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Hebrews 11.1, 1, I love this. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Here's what faith is. Faith is believing in the Lord no matter what. And you 100% rely on the word of God for everything that you do. That's faith. No matter what, no matter the phone call, no matter the mistake that you've made, faith. Because here's the truth. What is happening in and through you is an opportunity to increase the one thing that pleases God. Now, Michael, <laughs> one thing pleases God? Hebrews eleven six 6 says this. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The one thing that pleases God. Not working harder, not a performance, not going to church, not watching online, not I didn't yell at that person today, not I didn't beat my kids today, not man, I made it through another day, look how good I did without getting angry or upset, not being good, not being on a certain team at church. What pleases God? Faith. In those challenging moments, remember, in those challenging moments, our response is huge. And remember that God is not doing something to you. No, he's not doing something to you in hard moments. Please catch this. And we're going to see this in, in, as we look at Hannah. He's not doing something to you. He's trying to do something in you so that he can do something through you. That's what's happening. He is trying to elevate our faith because faith does not grow in comfort. You want to grow? It's going to take some hard times. You want to get strong? It's gonna take some breaking down of stuff. You wanna, you wanna be able to, to do things? It's gonna take going through hard times. And that's what we see with faith. So Hebrews 11.1 1 says this again. It says, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, or the evidence of that is which is not seen. So my question today to all of us, evidence, you need evidence. If you go to court, you've gotta have evidence. So today, my question is, where's the evidence of your faith? Where's the evidence of your faith? It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not what you've done. It's faith. And today, again, I want to look at Hannah of the Old Testament. And I want to see how her life shows us that truth today. So if you have a Bible, I would love for you to turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Look it on your phone or wherever you have the word of God. We'll also have it up on the screens. And in this series, we're, we're currently in a series in the Old Testament. And what I've noticed in the Old Testament, and it's really awesome, is that the same God of the Old Testament is the same God today. The same God that, that Peter was with in the New Testament, the same God today. That Jesus in the New Testament, the same God today. The same God that helped Moses is the same God today. And I hope that we see that as we, as we look at the scripture. Because today we're going to see in 1 Samuel the faithfulness of a woman that changes the course of a nation. So 1 Samuel 1 verse 2 says this, he had two wives. Oh, here we go. Yes. 
Some of y'all are like, amen. That sounds great. That's in the Bible? I thought you... <laughs> it is in the Bible. And in Genesis, just know, it says <laughs> the two become one. Here's the problem. He has two wives because, check this out, the first he married, Hannah, and the second, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah was childless. So back then, if you couldn't have children, you were looked down upon. And you were so looked down upon that it, it took you having to find somebody else that could have kids for you. And notice that Hannah, who we're gonna talk about, Hannah, it wasn't Elkanah's problem that she couldn't have children because Penina had children. You see what I'm saying? And so... He has two wives. But there's something so cool whenever I read this about Hannah, if you know about the Bible, that anytime that we've seen other barren women in the Bible, anytime we see someone that their womb is closed, if you will, anytime we see someone that can't have children, we see Sarah, Genesis 11. We see Rebecca, Genesis 25. They all ended up having a child. Rachel, Genesis 29. Samson's mom, Judges 13. Elizabeth, in Luke 1, we see that God uses barren women as key instruments in his plan of redemption. Her plan has potential locked up in it. It's potential locked up in her pain. So much potential. And so does yours. There is so much potential locked up in your pain as well. And you may not see that, but I promise you there's potential in that. God can take our total inability and make it our starting point. I hope that helps you today, somebody. God can take our total inability who we, where we think we are nowhere and he can use that as a starting point. In verse three, in verse three, this man who has two wives offered a sacrifice. Where am I? This man would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of armies at Shiloh. And Shiloh is very important. Actually, our pastor, uh, they just took a group to Israel and I think we may have some pictures of this. This is our group. Yes, uh, two days ago at Shiloh right here. And, and they're there, what we're talking about. How cool is that? I mean, just, just a really, really, really awesome thing. And Shiloh is so important because Shiloh is a, it, the word means most heavenly place. It was the center. It was in the very middle of where all the different tribes could come. So it was, it was a strategically placed as a religious center of the world at that time. Very holy. They had the tabernacle there, the tent of meeting. It was a place of sacrifice. It was a place of prayer. I want to call Shiloh today. Anytime you see the word Shiloh, I want to call that church. It's church. And notice how much they're going to church. And they're not going to church to soak. They're going to church to pray. In verse four, whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to each of her sons and daughters. Verse five, but he gave a double portion to Hannah. He loved her even though. He loved her even though the Lord, and I want you to notice that, the Lord kept her from conceiving at the end of verse five. He loved her even though. Society would say, why would you love her? I mean, I'm sure that there are people like Elk and I, like, dude, leave her. Like, she is worthless. She can't, she can't. And, and, and all these different voices probably talking to him. But I love the even though in here. Because the truth is the same for us. Can we love even though? Can we love even though they don't reply? Can we love even though they didn't listen? Can we love even though they didn't follow through again? Can we love even though we disagree? Can we love even though they're not Christians? Can we love even though? If we can't, then think we have a problem because God loves us even though. He loves us even though. We don't deserve it. At least I don't. I, I don't deserve it. And so I'm so thankful for the even though. And Elk and I loved her even though. God never gives us what we deserve. He gives us what he desires. He never gives us what we deserve. Praise the Lord. <laughs> he gives us what he desires. Verse six, her rival. I don't know if you've had a rival before. I know that Tennessee's got a game today and I'm trying to get done on time so we can get out of here and watch it. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse six, her rival. I don't know who that is today for you, but her rival is speaking of Penina would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept again. Notice the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. The Lord had kept her. And I mean, can you imagine 
You already can't have a child. And then you've got the sister wife hanging out with you constantly like, hey, look at my kids. Hey, can you watch my kids? I got to go to Publix. Hey, watch my kids, Hannah, because, man, I got a lot to do. I've got, you know, all these kids here. I know you can't have kids. <laughs> and that's really awful. And then, I mean, she's constantly, and she's going up to prayer, and she's going to church. I don't know if you've ever been to church before, and you're heading to church, and then all these other things are coming into your mind, and the enemy's coming at you, and like, ah, oh, you don't need to go to church, or you don't need to watch online, or just all these things are happening. Penina is constantly taking that open wound that she has and putting her finger in it and hurting her. What I love about First Baptist Cleveland, yes, we've got great preaching. Yes, we've got great music. Yes, we've got cool lights. Yes, we've got amazing children's ministry. Yes, we've got awesome youth ministry. Here's what I love about First Cleveland. Is the community of people that have surrounded me and my family when things got hard. This isn't just a church where a bunch of people come to. A lot of people, I don't want to go to that church. It's a big church. I completely disagree with you because it's a big church if this is all you come to. But when you start to sit down in circles, it takes the rows out of the way. And you start to have life with people. You start to form little communities. And I love First Cleveland because it truly is. I, I went to, uh, hung out with Stephen Beasley just the other day. He said, what do you think about Cleveland? I mean, I just went off on how beautiful and great it is because, and yes, because it's awesome outside and it'll be sunny one day and 70 degrees the next day it's snowing and the whole city shut down. I, what is up with that? Anyways, but I love First Cleveland because of the community and not only the community, but the community points you to Christ. And I'm thankful I would encourage you to get involved in a community if you need help with that, we'd love to help you. I also wanna encourage you this, sometimes we need to block some voices in our life. Notice that Hannah did that with Penina. She never responds to her. She never responds to her. You ever that person that texts you something really ugly and you're like, oh, okay. You're like, no. <laughs> or you know, someone says something and you're like, oh, excuse me, and you're just like, how about we start blocking the voices in our life that actually add nothing to it? How about we start blocking the people in our life that are bringing us down constantly? You would tell your kids to do that, so we should do the same thing. She blocked the voice of Penina. Man, verse seven we're about to read is so tough. Year after year, year after year, she went up to the Lord's house. She went to Shiloh and her rival taunted her in this way. Hannah would weep and would not eat. Year after year after year after, I don't know if you've had a year after year, a year after year, man, we've got COVID, oh, and then next year, oh, and you've got this coming up, man, year after year after year, there is something, and here's maybe year after year, you're praying for someone's salvation. Maybe year after year, you're, you're, you're praying for a child. I don't know what your year after year is, but I want you to notice the faithfulness of Hannah, and what did she do year after year, praise the Lord? She went to the Lord. She was faithful to the Lord. Because year after year, you need to remember this, year after year, God is on his throne. And year after year, the tomb is empty. Verse eight, men, please catch this. A lot of the dudes are like, no, I'm out. This is about Hannah, a woman. Please listen to this, men. If you've listened to nothing I've said and you're, you're please listen to this. Hannah, verse eight, this is Elkanah. Why are you crying? Oh, Hell, can I shut up? Like, I don't know if you've been in these moments, dudes, where you've said something, you're like, oh, look, look. Hannah, why are you crying? I mean, is he clueless? Hannah, why are you crying? Some of y'all are hitting your husband right now. El can I would ask, why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Dude, you married somebody else because of all, okay? El can I, am I not better to you than 10 sons? Guys, we gotta stop. Women, don't listen. We can't say stuff like, is that what you're wearing today? That's not good. Like, don't do that. Not that I've ever done that. Or are you gonna do your hair today? Ah, hey. Or is it that time? No, stop. Like, what time? Time to go? Like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Like, guys, you're making us look dumber than we already are. And Elkanah just brings it out to the open in the entire scripture for eternity. Stop. Verse nine. And look, look, look how Hannah responds. Verse nine. On one occasion, Hannah got up after that. She didn't say a word. I mean, she's just like, <sighs> okay. <laughs> On one occasion, Hannah, she got up. After they ate and drank at Shiloh, the priest Eli was sitting on the chair at the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord. 
Prayer is an invitation, write this down. Prayer is an invitation for God to take over our situation. Prayer is an invitation for God to take over our situation. She was at a deficit and she kept on praying. She was at a deficit and she kept on praying. I don't know if you've been in a deficit before, but I have, a few. One of the most recent, when we moved here, uh, my wife was pregnant. I have one wife, by the way, uh, and she was pregnant. And um, with our fourth child, Claire, and Erica went in to get a ultrasound and she came back from the ultrasound. I couldn't go with her because COVID. I don't know if y'all remember that. You couldn't go anywhere with anybody. She had to do all of those appointments by herself and she came out and she came home and she's crying, which is rare for my wife. I'm the crier in the family. And so she comes home, she comes home and she's crying. And I'm like, oh, this, this isn't good. And she says, so the ultrasound shows that Claire, well, I didn't know her name at that time. Uh, we didn't know the gender. Claire has really no brain activity. And she's going to be born most likely heavily mentally retarded. I mean, and, and it was awful. And I'm looking at her like, oh, this is real. You're, oh, no. So our response is we're going to love her, period, no matter what. No matter what, we're going to love this baby. And that's some really tough news when you've been thinking about all these other things. And so what did it do in the deficit for us? Man, we started praying a little bit different. That truly changed my prayer life. She'd be asleep, and I'd have my hand just praying for that child, praying, God, you can do this. I would go running and I'd probably look so weird. I'm weeping and crying out to the Lord because I was at a deficit and I was like, God, please do something. I mean, I was just praying and praying. I, I, I reached out to a few people in this community that could pray with us. And that deficit brought a whole new level of prayer inside of us, a whole new level of faith. I had to figure it out. I had to figure it out. The great thing is, praise the Lord, that she was born completely healthy. Everything is great. She cries a lot. Thank you very much. She, you can go hold her right now over there if you'd like to, or even come to our house and you can babysit for us. She's great. But the truth is, in that deficit, I'm, I'm thankful now because I was able to see how I could lean in and, and pray a little bit more. And the truth was, if, if she was born with these things, guess what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, because that is his plan, and that's what he has. And we would have loved her exactly the same. If we want to go to another level, we've got to grow our faith to another level, even at a deficit. And she is here at a deficit. All the things coming at Hannah. Verse 11, making a vow. She pleaded, Lord of armies, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction. Look at this, underline this. Remember and not forget me, praise the Lord. I don't know if you've ever been in moments where you're praying like, God, if you're there, yoo-hoo, hey, God, if, will you remember me? Will you remember me? And that's what she's saying right there. Will you remember me? And not forget me. Let's keep going. I lost my place. Remember me. Verse 12. While she continued praying, that's massive. I'd underline that. Massive. While she continued praying, you ever given up on praying because you never got what you wanted? So you just stopped. She continued praying in the Lord's presence. Eli watched her mouth. Now picture this. She's praying. She went to, the Sh she went to Shiloh. She's there. There's a priest there. She's praying. And she kept on praying. She kept on praying. She kept on praying. Verse 13. Hannah was praying silently and her lips were moving and her voice could not be heard. You ever been that sad where you just can't get the words out because you're so sad and people say, hey, what's wrong? And you, uh, and you, you can't do it because you're that sad. And it looks kind of weird, like what is wrong with you? Verse 14, it looked really weird to Eli. He said to her, how long have you, are you going to be drunk? <laughs> uh, verse 15, no, my Lord, Hannah replied, I'm a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. She's covering it both. She's saying, I'm not, I'm not classy or country, okay? I am, I am fine right here. I've been pouring out my heart to the Lord. In verse 16, she says, don't think of me as a, wicked, uh, as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depths of my anguish and resentment. Eli responded, go in peace. Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant the request you've made of him. Verse 18, huge. Notice what happens in verse 18. Notice what happens in verse 18. May your servant find favor with you, she says to Eli. 
She's weeping, she's crying, she can't eat, all the things. Then Hannah went on her way. She ate and no longer looked despondent. So what just happened? What just happened? Her faithfulness allowed her to hear a word. Her faithfulness allowed her to hear a word and she got a word. She got a word and it added to her faith. This is the word of God. So you know, this is the word of God. And we should, we should eat on this all the time. We should be in this. We should be doing that. But the word that she got right here, it's called a rhema word, which is a word, an in-season word. It's a word for you. You ever felt like Pastor Jordan's up here preaching and he is speaking through your soul? You're like, ah, that's a rhema word for you. That is how God takes the word and gives us a word. She didn't get a child. She got a word. She didn't get everything that she was praying for at that moment, but she got a word and she went and she changed. She didn't say, hey, thanks, priest, pastor, and move on. No, she got a word. Very similar to whenever in Acts 2, you've got, you've got, Peter and John and they're going up to worship and this dude is on, is on the ground and he's, he's begging and he's been there. He's, he's been carried there since birth. He's been brought there since birth and what he does, he begs for things. And Peter and John are going up and they're, they're going to church, right? They're going to church. And what do they do? There's another guy just begging. No, what did they do? They stopped. They stopped and he said, the guy begging said, hey, can you, can you give me something? What did he say? He said, no, I, I, don't, I don't have anything physically to give you, but what I will give you is all you need. It's Jesus. So get up and walk. He got a word. And what did he do? He walked. He started walking out that truth right there. And he went into the church and people saw him like, is that the dude that's always been begging there for? Yeah, he's walking, he's healed. And the same can be true with us. Sometimes we get a word, but what do we do? We're still down here begging for God. That, that's not really what I wanted, but we, we get a word truly. And here's what we can do with that word. Even though it's hard, even though it may not look right, even though you may look drunk, walk with the word and in that faithfulness. We know, we've got to know, we've got to remember that he is the same God here that we're reading about. He's the same God here today. He's the same God then that he is today. So why wouldn't he wanna heal you? Why wouldn't he wanna see you walk it out? Why wouldn't he? He wants to, but do you believe it? Are you faithful in your belief that that really can happen to you? Or are you sitting there thinking, no, this is where I'm at in life. But your response has to be faith. We've got to stop sitting at the gate and begging. We've got to start taking some steps and walking. Samuel's birth, hello, in verse 19. The next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to worship the Lord. Afterward, they returned home to Ramah. They got intimate and the Lord remembered her. The Lord remembered her. Verse 20, after some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel because she said, I requested him from the Lord. What Samuel's name mean? It actually means asked of God, asked of God. Hannah's message was that of faithfulness. Her faith grew in the taunting. Her faith grew even in the sadness. Her faith grew in the barrenness. Her faith grew in the prayers. Her faith grew in the discomfort. God was definitely doing something in her because he ended up doing something so great through her. He's the same God. He's the same God. 